All right, welcome to module two, which is where we're talking about our remote sensing platforms. And so this this module really looks at the turn the like remote sensing in terms of where is it located um, in in like space, I guess, and like vertically <laughs> altitude, uh, and it it really. Um, also looks at like the difference between platforms and sensors and how they kind of interact between each other. So I'm going to jump right into objective 2.1, which is comparing terrestrial, aerial, and satellite-based platforms in terms of altitude applications and resolutions. But before I get too far into this, because we just finished with all of the physics and everything that I needed you guys to know about the physics side, we need to define what remote sensing is. So remote sensing is the science, art, and technology of measuring, analyzing, synthesizing, observing, and processing of data collected from a distance without contact in no particular order. I wrote this up, I create, I create the definition, recreate the definition every year based on everyone's input. So we're going to um, obviously not be doing that to this year, but that's okay. So remote sensing, and just to kind of break this down, let's look at it. It's from a distance without contact, which means that I don't actually touch the object that I am trying to measure. And so that is a really cool thing. Like you guys do this with, with surveying all the time. What are you measuring? A distance using an EDM. What are you doing? You're measuring a location using GPS. We, you guys do remote sensing all the time. The only difference is I now am bringing in the components of art. So we, the reason I bring in art is because it's a visualization. It's not just numbers. So we have science and technology, which looks at the, well, what we just talked about. So it's all a lot of that scientific physics and and lens designs and optics and, and all of that fun stuff. Um, also like the measurement side of things and the analysis of data. And there's a lot more analyzing and remote sensing than there is um, in terms of like the surveying component. Um, we just have a different style of analyzing. We synthesize, we can put a whole bunch of stuff together with it um, and observe it, like just even just looking at it. But the art component comes in by making this readable. Everyone uses technology, so it's kind of like an added word there, but the art is so that people can read it, people can understand it, and they can do make decisions based on a visualization. So there's an art of being able to balance numbers with visualization, and that comes into remote sensing here. So we're taking a look at platforms. So starting off, um, I have this little diagram from the textbook, from an old textbook. So down here, I have ground observations down at the bottom. It's also known as a terrestrial platform. So this is how, where, where is my sensor? Now the sensor, this doesn't mean that it's sitting on the floor. Listen, you're not putting a camera on the floor. It is the platform where it is sitting. So here you should see a guy taking a look at a, at a crop, right? So he can see a certain portion of that crop on his own. Then there's a guy in the truck on a boom and he can see a little bit more of the crop at a different angle. Both of these guys are terrestrial platforms. If I were to put a, a security system up on a, um, a t sky rise or high rise tower down, downtown, that is considered a ground observation because the platform itself is sitting on the ground. Now what makes really things a lot of fun is when you get into airborne platforms. So airborne, there's two different kinds. There's low altitude and there's high altitude. Now the low altitude can be like drones, right? Now drones are airborne because they don't actually sit on the ground, but they can be lower than a terrestrial platform, which makes things really confusing. The reason is, is that, that, that drones are always going to be airborne, even if they are below a terrestrial platform, is because there is the possibility of shifting around in the air. So there's a different kind of correction that comes with that. And it also needs to point at a certain angle where like for us, like with a, with a drone, if, if you were to like 
try to turn your sensor around and do all kinds of fun stuff, your drone starts to get bigger and bigger because you need more and more equipment on there to move it. Where with um, with a ground cord or a ground platform, you can turn any direction. It's not a big deal. Generally speaking, the drones are kind of pointing down or sort of semi down. Um, going back to uh, going back to maps 204, we talked about oblique um, perspective and the vertical perspective. So that's what a drone can do as well. Then low altitude data can also be like low altitude airplanes, which is a fixed wing aircraft, or it can be a helicopter. So that's another one that's considered low altitude. As we move up, we can get to like bigger airplanes that are going faster. Um, we can also have weather balloons. That's also considered a high altitude. High altitude is anything in the higher atmosphere. There's no real like cutoff. It's not like you know at a certain distance and now you're considered high altitude. Uh, sometimes you'll see people say, well, if it's above the clouds, it's high altitude. Sure, we can go with that. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be though. So weather balloons, um, large aircraft, larger aircrafts can be high altitude. Then we, that's all like the airborne stuff. Then we move into spaceborne. Now there is, there are shuttles. Shuttles are a, a an interesting platform because they kind of are high altitude airborne platforms, but they're also kind of space pro platforms. So they're like low space platforms. So they can be one or the other, dep just depending on where they sit. And if they are in a like almost zero gravity situation, then that that shuttle is now considered space borne. Then we have satellites, which is what we're going to be dealing mostly with this in this class, um, and that's space borne. And we will do a little bit of airborne and terrestrial, maybe terrestrial in thermal imaging, but other than that, that that's pretty much it for the lower, lower platforms. So we're dealing with satellite data. Um, there are deep space probes as well, and those are also considered remote sensing platforms. We're look and that we're not really using those ones. We're going to be using closer ones to the Earth. So then thinking of satellites, because that's what we're going to be using, we need to worry about a satellite orbit. So here are the parameters that we're dealing with. So we have our Earth, which is this ball that's sitting here. And then we have what we call the orbital track, which is the orbit of the satellite itself. Below the orbital track, along the Earth's surface, we have something called a ground track. And going from one side of the gr ground track to the other, being the width of it, that is known as a swath width. So it's the swath width of the ground track, or that is the ground track. The ground track is the whole strip. Then we go, f we have two points on, on the satellite, sorry, the orbital track. One is the perigee, and the other one is the apogee. Perigee, sorry, perigee and apogee. So the perigee, as it goes, we it is the point where we have the descending side of the track changing into ascending. So we have ascending going up, descending going down. The apogee is where the opposite happens, where we go from ascending to descending. And the, that's of importance because the perspective is very different. So you think, you know, when you walk into a room versus from one side versus the other, it looks different. And it's like, well, no, it doesn't. But yes, it does. What, what do you actually see when you're looking kind of down? You might, if you come in through the back of a classroom, you're seeing the backs of the chairs. If you come in through the front of the classroom, you're seeing the fronts of the chairs. So you're actually getting two different views of the exact same area, just depending on which, um, which perspective you're looking at it. So that's why ascending and descending, you actually have to know that when you're dealing with your satellites because that tells you what, what's happening, what face am I seeing on the mountains, what is actually considered a peak, what is actually considered a valley, because those, those get really confusing if you don't know. The next important one is the inclination angle. So we have our equator that goes around the Earth's surface. You guys are going to get to know all of these um, coordinate systems, the astronomic coordinate system. Um, so the inclination angle you'll be very familiar with, but what it is in, in for now, because you guys haven't started that, is if we take the orbital track and we make a plane out of it, and then we take the equator and we make a plane out of the equator. So we have the two, we have two ellipse, um, ellipses, and one of them is at an angle to the other. 
the inclination angle is from that equator to the um, to the orbital track plane and I'm not going to get into a lot of the details about where that inclined how they measure that and everything but you will find that there's some satellites they're like oh it's like 93 degrees for an inclination angle that means that it's, it's tipped to the side GPS is like 55 degrees I think and so that one is also tipped so that's why we have these angles here and they're all based on that inclination angle based around the equator so then we have objective 2.3 um, going into what is geosynchronous versus sun synchronous. So these two concepts, geosynchronous is the satellite staying at a single place on the ground. So it actually, the orbital track stays with the Earth all the time. So it doesn't actually change its location. So it, it'll see like all of North America. And that's all, that's all it ever sees. It never gets to see anything new. It's always going to be North America. In order to do that, in order to get it to actually stay there, it has to be located at the equator. So a lot of like telecommunication satellites, um, those are all placed as geosynchronous satellites. So if you get like Sirius XM, um, it is a geosynchronous satellite. If you get satellite TV, it is a geosynchronous satellite. Uh, weather, uh, um, sorry, weather satellites, those are geosynchronous satellites. And they are always really far away. So geosynchronous satellites cover a huge amount of land because they have to be, and because they are placed so far away from the equator. And the downfall with that is that anything closer to the poles becomes really distorted, right? So you have like the equator, which is really close and good scale, and then it like elongates everything. So if you've ever seen a weather satellite picture of Canada, it is a really strange looking map. And that is because the geosynchronous satellites are sitting at the equator and is trying to project the information that it knows up to the poles and so therefore that satellite has to be really far away so to be able to do that so that is um, that's a geosynchronous satellite always staying on the same spot on the earth all the time and it's always placed at the equator and they're really far away sun synchronous are a little bit different so sun synchronous is more similar to what I um, what I was just talking about so this one stays on the illuminated side of the earth all the time so um, it's also known as polar orbiting because it sees the poles and then um, and then it so it goes around and it always passes the equator so it has to be an ellipse and it has to have it go around the center of mass so like going back to the inclination angle those two planes connect at the center of mass and that that's the center of both planes okay so so this since sun synchronous satellite, why does it? Why is it called sun synchronous? Because it stays in the sun. It most of these have um, have solar panels on them, um, or they are trying to capture data that is illuminated by the sun. Um, so that that's why it stays on that. But because it's closer to the Earth, it actually is. Um, it, it can be a lot better for resolution, right? So if we go back speaking of resolution let's just go back to this here so here I can see if I'm standing on the ground I can see blades of grass if I move up to a low altitude I can see a plant if I move up to high altitude I can see rows if I move up to satellite I see a field so I'm zooming out so I'm going to see less detail so if I go back here with my geosynchronous and sun synchronous, the geosynchronous is seeing like basically continents with some clouds and like big clouds. The sun synchronous is seeing more detail. So the, the best, um, best way to think about this in terms of resolution, because we talked a little bit about that in the module one, the spatial resolution is going to be higher for sun synchronous and lower for geosynchronous, just merely because of the distance it is. So moving into objective 2.4, this is looking at the capabilities of multispectral satellites. So there are a couple types of sensors. So this is what we're going to 
um, be examining here and not so much the platform. So we're moving on from, from the satellite platform to what equipment is on there. So scanning options, we have three different ways of doing it. We have a frame camera, which takes the entire scene at one time. So this is what you guys are most used to. You are, you, you take a photograph and it captures the entire photo all at once. Done, right? Then um, you can add a flash to it, it, makes it really easy. So it takes the whole thing. I, when you do deal with frame cameras, it, it tends to take a lot of energy to try to capture a lot of that, but it also has a poor resolution. The reason why is because of all the data that it has to c capture all at once. And your, the digital array in the back that's detecting the light, that, that needs to be designed in a way to, to be able to capture that. So they tend to be a little bit lower in, um, in resolution. Uh, and that's just the way it is. A long track scanner, if you go up to space, it, your long track scanner is one, probably one of the most common ones. So it, a long track is a push broom scanner. So if you think of a push broom, um, that's like the janitor broom, which is like a long wide broom. And you put it down on the ground and you just walk along. The amount of energy that it requires for you to use it is very low because all it does is pick up dirt as it goes. This is exactly how this scanner works. It picks up the swath width, which is the ground track, right? The swath width as it goes. Picks up a whole row of pixels as it goes. It does have the highest spectral resolution. So if you're looking at um, high spec, no, that should say spatial, not spectral. High spatial resolution. Well, I'll fix that later. <laughs> so the highest spatial resolution, um, and it does allow, and it actually, you know what, it does have the high spectral as well because of the fact that it's um, most multispectral sensors are a long track and that it would include hyperspectral. So there we go. Yes, it, that, that is right. I wasn't thinking about that. So that's right. But the most common, this is really, the long track is the most common. Cross track scanners. These are known as whisk broom scanners. So if you can imagine you've got a straw broom and you're sweeping it across back and forth. So when you have a, a whisk broom, it's a smaller broom and it goes from one side of you to the other and it's like mechanical. It requires a lot more energy. So if you're using an acro a cross track scanner, you need to be on a, a sun synchronous satellite because it needs to be in the sunlight all the time because it's got a mechanical thing it needs to run. Um, and it just picks up one pixel at a time as it goes. So this is beneficial for things like laser scanning, um, microwaves, uh, we do everything with cross-track scanners. Uh, so that's because it has to send out energy and receive it. A lot of active sensors will use cross-track scanners. And that's just because of the nature of, the, of, of what data it's getting. So, so the yes, they are used and you, you you may not use them a lot unless you get into the more specialty types of remote sensing, but you'll definitely see a long track scanners and frame cameras a lot of the time. Now, just a couple examples of multispectral satellites. So we have Landsat, QuickBird, Worldview, Econo, Spot, Pleiades, Dove, and more, so many more. I think the last time I checked, there was something like 300 remote sensing satellites in space. And there's probably more than that since I've checked. So there are a ton of multispectral satellites. And these ones are specific to multispectral, so not like panchromatic or um, microwave or anything like that. So we'll probably be doing an activity based on these satellites for you to investigate a little bit more in detail. Otherwise, it becomes a very dry uh, lecture of me just talking about these over and over again. So these, every, these are everything from like NASA and um, ESA, so NASA is American, ESA is European Space Agency, we have the Canadian Space Agency, um, the, but the Canadian Space Agency looks after the microwave side of things. Um, so these are those, they're also, some of them are commercial satellites, so you can actually pay for their stuff and, and go on there and you can get what you need specifically because they're client-based. So moving into objective 2.5, there is the need to distinguish between sensor methods. Um, so these are 
And there's really two ways that sensors um, acquire their data. One of the ways is a passive sensor, and this is known as a one-way ranging sensor. So in remote sensing, all it does is acquire information. So it just takes it in. It's not going to send you anything. Um, it, well, it does have a communication device so that the data can make it to Earth, but that's not the actual sensor. That's another, that's a computer component. The passive sensors acquire usually sunlight. So the sunlight comes down and hits the Earth's surface and then whatever energy comes back and that's what it's detecting. Um, also, like another example of passive sensors is a microwave passive sensor and the Earth emits like a, a fair amount of its own microwave energy and snow is like the highest amount of microwave energy that's being released. So uh, we would use a passive sensor and we can measure the snow um, packs using passive sensors. Our eyes are also passive sensors. Sensors, you use it every day because they don't send out energy. The next one is active sensors. So the other kind, this is the other version, and this is known as two-way ranging. Um, so it sends out its own energy and then receives it back. So LIDAR and microwaves, active microwaves, is SAR, which is what it's called. Those are active sensors. A flash on a camera is an active sensor. So it sends out the light so that it can receive the light. And these are a little bit more energy intensive types of sensors rather than the passive, but they are they they have their own reasons as to why they do that. And part of it is nighttime. Part of it is like, for example, LIDAR is lasers. So it needs to have a special special kind of energy and very specific energy. You can't just accept anything. So um, so that that's an active sensor. So our again, to help you remember, our eyes are passive. Otherwise, if they were active sensors, we would be shooting laser beams out of our eyes so that we would receive back information so that we would, would be able to see. Unfortunately, we don't get to do that. But it would be pretty cool. Though. Pretty, uh, but then again, you know, if everyone was doing it, then it wouldn't be really all that cool because it's just normal, right? Anyway. <laughs> all right. So there, so there's a couple examples here of, you know, satellites sending out data and receiving it. It's an active sensor, the passive sensor just receives. Like, so whatever, whether it go down and up or whether it's just from the earth and up, it just receives, that's all it gets. So we talked a little bit about spectral resolution when we were talking uh, um, about, uh, about resolutions. So there's a couple terms in here that I'm, throwing, I'm bringing in. So the first one is bands. This is the, like, the area on the electromagnetic spectrum that that sensor can collect. So that is looking at, you know, how many bands are there. So, and a sensor itself might have three bands that it, it accepts. So you can think of it in terms of slots on the sensor. So how many slots does it have to receive certain kinds of information? And that's what that band is. The band width is how wide that band is on the electromagnetic spectrum. So how many wavelengths fall within that, that band? Sometimes they're very wide, which ends up usually becoming a panchromatic image. Sometimes they're very narrow, which can become more like a, either a laser or it can become more like a hyperspectral image. So bandwidth can vary and bands can vary. These are based on the sensor, not the platform. It is very frustrating to a remote sensing person to hear somebody say, well, I got all the bands on Landsat. And it's like, well, actually you got it from OLLI, the, the o OLI. And you didn't, or the TIRS, the TIRS, you did not get it from Landsat. Landsat is the platform, okay? So the, the sensor itself is the actual equipment that's doing the, the data collection. Then talking about, this is a little bit separate from what we've been talking about here, but that is looking at the spectral, or not spectral, specular and diffuse reflectance. So, um, we've talked about this already, like we already kind of talked about it in the previous one, so I'm just going to go through this really quick just as a reminder, because again, it's really important. This is how we see, this is how we deal with our, our sensors. So if we have a mirror, we have an incident ray and a reflected ray, this is ideally that the reflected ray has 100% reflectance um, with a mirror. So the data I 
that was sent is 100% of the data that I receive, and it's going to be at that angle. Um, if I have a mirror, microwaves with water, for example, if you have smooth water, smooth water becomes black. The reason being that the microwaves send down the energy, it hits the water, and it reflects away, and the satellite has already moved. It hasn't moved to that location, so it doesn't get that data. If we have specular reflection, it's the same idea. You just have the multiple rays being reflected exactly like a mirror. So we call this a smooth surface, um, and specular reflection happens there. Generally speaking, if I'm referring to reflection, it's going to be one of these two. I don't really like using diffuse reflection. It just sounds really funny to me as a term, but you will see it, as you can see here in this diagram. Um, I prefer calling it diffuse scattering. And you also see spectral scattering as they're spectral, I'm stuck on spectral, specular scattering. Um, again, that, that seems weird because it's not it's not really scattered, it's reflected. So you just depending on who you talk to, we'll switch back between reflection and scattering, and then they'll throw the words of specular or diffuse in front of them. But that's that's people, right? <laughs> Everyone's got to have their own way. So diffuse scattering is when the rays come down and hit a surface and go in all different kinds of directions. So you can see that this ground is much more rough. So as the energy comes down, each piece of energy is going in different ways. Now we talked about the um, Rayleigh and me and um, non-selective scattering and how that can, like, you have some that reflects back, some that reflects forward, some of it reflects in all different directions. That's diffuse scattering or reflection, as it says here. All right, so acquiring a multispectral image. I am going to try to go through this relatively fast because you're going to have another video that actually shows this step by step with the software. I'm just going to go through these steps um, in a verbal way. So the, where can you get free images? open source images. Well, there's the USGS Earth Explorer, and that's what we're using. There's Land Viewer, there's the Copernicus Open Access Hub, there's Sentinel Hub, there's Na NASA Earth Data Search, there's the Remote Pixel, there's the IMP Image Catalog, um, there's old button, and there's more. There's so many more. There's like GeoGratis. There's like all kinds of stuff. And it, sometimes they're there, and then they disappear, and they move on to other things. So you we're, we're going to use Earth Explorer because that's currently kind of the, the go-to place for Landsat data. And we're going to be using Landsat data. So that is um, a, a list there. So you can, if you find more, fantastic, because you can always check out different sensors. So there are videos on this. So this seems like really condensed. Um, and so I'm just going to review it because then you've heard it. If you're just watching these now, and then you'll be like, okay, when I get to the video and go through it slowly, I've already heard those terms, so it might be faster. So what you're going to do is you're going to go to earthexplorer.usgs.gov. You're going to register. Now, when you go to register, you're going to sign up for an account. Pretty much any of the questions in there, it's like education or limited use, and that's, you're not making income off of it. That's the kind of stuff there. Even if you were to say the exact opposite of what I'm saying, they're not going to change the way that they deal with you. At, at, at all. So you can say whatever you want. I just leave it as education stuff because um, I like to be able to go back <laughs> just in case they find out that I was lying and then all of a sudden fraud comes in. So that's probably a bad idea. But um, make sure you do that. You're welcome to use Sate's um, address if you don't want to use your own. I use my personal one and I still have not had the U.S. government show up at my doorstep. So I think we're doing okay so far. Um, then you're going to go to the map and you're going to set a marker close to the location you want. You're going to choose a date range. Just remember with the date range that only 100 of the most recent images are going to show. So if you um, set a date range from like 2013 to, 220, to 2020, it, it's only going to show 2020 and you won't get anything new or like older than that. So you have to set it down a little bit further. Keep in mind, though, that we are not going to be doing anything before 2013 in this class. Sometimes I encourage people to go back further. Um, if you do want to go back further, please talk to me. Um, I have no problems with helping you out with the data from before that. But there's really nothing from 2003 to 2013. 
It's because the sideline corrector on Landsat 7 broke. But anyway, then we're going to, you're going to go to the data sets button or tab. You're going to expand Landsat, and then you're going to expand Landsat Collection 1 Level 1. You're going to choose like a little check mark in the box, but Landsat 8, all 8 slash TIRS, tiers. Then you're going to click on results. It's a button. Then you're going to find an image that has the least amount of cloud or snow. You will identify s cloud as white, fluffy things. Sometimes they look fluffy. Sometimes it's just solid. Sometimes it's like wisps through. Um, snow tends to show up as bright blue. So like a baby blue, if it doesn't look natural blue, it's probably not water. And I can pretty much guarantee that most of your pictures are not going to be water. Water tends to be very dark. So if it's a bright blue color, then it's probably snow or ice. If you are looking at glaciers, that's OK to have some of the glaciers, but make sure that the, the slope sides are not showing up as white or bright blue. Then um, and if you, if you look, zoom in a little bit, well, you, you may not be able to do it very well with their viewer. But if you take a look, look for little white specks. And then see if you can see a black spot below it. If you do see that, or a dark spot below it, if you do see that, that's a cloud. So you're going to try to find as little as possible. I want you to make sure that you have less, less than 25% of the image that has any cloud showing. And that means that you have, um, you need to have at least 20, your own, at least 25% of the image that has absolutely no clouds. Okay, because otherwise you're going to just end up showing change detection with clouds and that's no good to anybody. So I want you to find an image. Now that means you have to avoid cloudy places. That means Hawaii is terrible. Please, if you're going to do Hawaii, you're going to be searching for a very long time. And yes, it's going to be tedious. So I'm warning you now, if you want to do Hawaii, if you want to do, I think, um, any like coastal country or the coast of something, you're probably going to struggle. Um, so just if you know, if you're aware of that now, you know that you're going to take some time to look at it because you really need to make sure there's no clouds in that. And like even like hazy stuff, like you got to make sure it's nothing. Norway's terrible. It's another one that's a bad one. Um, lots of cloud there. Venezuela is really bad. Mm. Although I've had some really good results from the rainforest, the Amazon rainforest. So that, that works out pretty good. So just depending on where you are and what time of year, you'll, you'll just need to check that out. So be careful with that. But anything white, anything like bright blue, get rid of it. You're not going to use that image. And you're going to click the download button. So the download button is this little, like over on the, on the right hand side, you're going to see a little green arrow with a hard drive. Click on that and then look for the largest memory um, value. And that's the file to download. So it should say, level one GeoTIFF data product. It should say something along those lines. It should have those words within it. Um, do not do any of the little files. If it is not like 900 mega, yeah, megabytes, then it's probably not what you're looking for, okay? So it should be at least nine, like 700 and 900 kil megabytes. It is going to be the biggest file. Choose that. So then you're gonna download it, you're gonna wait, do not open it, just save it. So save that file, it's, it's going to give you an error. And then you'll be like, I don't know where I saved it. So whatever downloading system you have there, you're just going to, you can open it in the folder or whatever you need to do, but do not try opening the file upon it being downloaded. And then you're going to unzip it. So this is an interesting process every time that we go through it. And it's going to be even more interesting because you're doing this at home. So the 7-zip um, function or program, it can be used to extract. If you happen to have a Linux system at home because you love computers, um, you can also use Linux to extract all these. So the, like the Linux system has its own unzip version, depending on what platform you're running. So you can extract the .gz file. So it's the very first file. You're going to right click it, you're going to go into 7-zip, you're going to say extract file, and it's going to open up a new unzip file folder, and it's going to say .tar at the end. If you go into that folder that is um, 
that you're able to get into, you're going to see a single file that says .tar. It's going to be named exactly the same as the folder. I need you to right click that one and then do the same extraction. So this file is extracted twice and make sure that when you've unzipped it, again you've unzipped it twice, you're going to end up with a whole bunch of TIFF files. And you should see like 13 of them actually to be exact. Or yeah, 12. 12 of them, not 13. I'm going for a baker's dozen today. <laughs> so you can see 12 of them. So you can see 12 TIFF files, you're going to see an MTL file, you're going to see a couple other versions of files. And don't worry about opening them because in, right now you're going to be opening them in NB when we get there. So this um, this is kind of brings you to the end of the of the module. And um, if you're getting really excited, you're welcome to give it a try. You can you can bring them in um, in NV if you go to File Open and you can just open the MTL file then that will give you a quick overview. We're going to be doing it in another way in this class just because there's a few features that I need you to learn and this is just a, there's a learning process. So, um, but if you want to do a quick view, go into MV, file, open, open the MTL file once it's unzipped and you're good. Make sure that all of the, this data is in a folder called raw data. And once it's in raw data, it may like put all those TIFF files in raw data. You might want to keep the, the double zipped file as well. And if you keep that, then you know that you've always got backup if you lose it. So raw data folder, put it, make a raw data folder and put it all in there. And then make a backup somewhere because you don't want to have to do this again. So that is the um, module two, and here's a couple references that you can check out with the, that have to do with my um, images that I chose to put in this PowerPoint. And we'll be starting module three next week.